So this, uh, uh, of course, retinoic acid is a therapy that uh, is particularly successful in APL where uh, there is a strong mechanistic rationale for using it um, based on the fact that the initiating oncogene uh, affects the receptor for retinoic acid. Now, a presentation here at ASH is showing that the addition of retinoic acid to non-APL types of AML, in particular those associated with mutations in NPM, may benefit from addition of retinoic acid. Well, it's a bit hard to understand. Also, it's not entirely uh, understandable how the ATRA is working in these types of AMLs because for APL, it's pretty clear it's directly acting on the initiating oncogene. For the e these other um, types of disease, it could be a more generalized pro-differentiating effect. Uh, which may be helping uh, the effect that the standard chemotherapy already has. Uh, but the, so um, probably in the, in the past it was harder to um, identify a specific subgroup in which this drug would have had some effect. Now uh, with the advent of uh, increased uh, genetic characterization of AMLs, it's becoming better understood that there are specific subtypes that may be benefiting uh, of this uh, therapy, although through yet, uh, as yet, not entirely uh, well understood mechanisms. Mm -hmm. It is, but it's also, of course, extremely toxic and uh, not always as well tolerated. And of course, also the paradoxical problem that we have with chemotherapy is that very often, since uh, some, a lot of uh, uh, hematological patients are young patients, um, there is a relatively high incidence of secondary tumors in chemotherapy treated individuals uh, after a few years. Uh, so getting rid of, of chemotherapy could be, uh, if you want, the next big uh, step in, in oncology. And we have already seen that happening in APL, for instance. Now, genetic sequencing, I know, is, uh, is really high on the agenda. Most medical meetings these days, uh, there's been a lot of talk about biology, but um, I gather that in a lecture, uh, Professor Dona was talking about bench to bedside, actually getting it, really applying it. What do you make of this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, last year marked the, uh, if you want, the turning point in genetics into clinics because uh, um, all the data of big uh, genetic efforts, genetic um, screening uh, sequencing efforts have been published, mainly the TCGA uh, program, but a number of other consortia have published uh, uh, large uh, scale uh, genetic characterization of several malignancies, including uh, uh, myeloid malignancies. And up to last year, all this was uh, an effort mostly directed to understanding, to better understanding the biology of, uh, of the disease. But now we're seeing that a number of uh, concepts arising from uh, all these efforts are making their way into, uh, into the clinics. And they're certainly helping uh, a lot uh, to uh, stratify patients according to different uh, risk groups and uh, probably defying uh, what were the uh, standard clinically based uh, uh, prognostic scores and maybe in the long run they are going to also lead to the identification of precise targets that we can then uh, attack with the specific therapies. At the moment it certainly is the most immediately payable, uh, if you want, uh, benefit, absolutely. So it's helping us to identify patients that would look, uh, for instance, uh, non-treatable or there should, according to standard and classical prognostic scores, should be treated with uh, in a certain way and they are helping us to modify our treatment into, uh, for instance, this is particularly evident in some diseases where you have um, patients where you are usually unwilling to carry out a certain treatment, for instance, mild dysplastic syndromes in which um, a lot of uh, very unexpected findings came from genetic screens, for instance, uh, uh, mutations in splicing factors and epigenetic factors being extremely common. 
and uh, being uh, differentially associated with a prognosis. So now you have a patient, as uh, Professor Donner uh, pointed out yesterday, uh, that according to classical scores would not have been treated because uh, its disease was thought to, to uh, move on in a very, uh, with a very slow pace, but now you know that, for instance, there's a P53 mutation and you are willing to treat that patient because it may evolve more easily into an AML. Well, uh, it's, it's, going to, uh, it's going to happen for sure. I mean, we've seen that happening uh, uh, with pretty, mu pretty much everything in medicine. At the beginning, uh, it's mostly probably based on the ease with which we are able to carry out this type of testing. And up to now, the real bottleneck has been cost and the complexity of the test. But now this is becoming increasingly easier uh, for routine labs to carry out. So, um, it's probably not going to encounter too much resistance. Mm -hmm. So think. genetic sequencing is a fascinating subject here at the EHA. But just one more question on this though. Um, we tend to think that with sequencing, this next generation sequencing, this detailed information of the genome, we could find targets and perhaps find one really good target and a drug or perhaps a collection of targets and a collection of drugs which will really make huge steps forward. Is that your thought? Well, I think uh, there's been a tendency towards thinking about uh, next-gen sequencing as a way to identifying uh, mutated targets to attack. But I think we should move uh, past this way of thinking because a lot of uh, druggable targets are not actually mutated in these uh, cancers. Uh, so uh, we've seen it today, for instance, in the AML session with a number of drugs entering phase one trial that are not actually targeting specific mutations like uh, WINT inhibitors or NET inhibitors. They are generalized, um, if you want, inhibitors. They inhibit specific uh, biological pathways, but these are not necessarily the pathways that are mutated in these patients. But what the genetic screen could allow us to understand is which patients are more susceptible to a specific targeting, even if the drug does not target that specific mutation. Absolutely. So what's going to happen is that we are going to slice each disease in more and more in, in smaller and smaller uh, pieces and each piece is going to be highly sensitive to one specific uh, uh, tar uh, drug and um, this is going to help us to uh, really uh, assign uh, the best treatment uh, in the least toxic way to each patient. That is correct and uh, I was giving the example of a P53 mutated MDS uh, patient that um, would not be treated necessarily with an aggressive uh, approach nowadays but now we know that those patients will have a much higher uh, um, chance of uh, um, uh, shifting their MDS into an AML and so they will require um, a more aggressive treatment.